Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Ukraine's fate is in the balance. The regime reigning in Kiev is of dubious legitimacy, and the upcoming vote in the Crimea in all likelihood puts the country's sovereignty into question. Indeed, Ukraine is being torn apart. But by whom? To cross up the crisis in Ukraine, I'm joined by my guest, John Pfeffer in Washington. He is the co-director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. Also in Washington, we have Ivan Elin. He is a senior fellow and director of the Independent Institute. And here in Moscow, we cross to John Helovig. He is a managing partner at Avara Group. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules. In effect, that means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Ivan Elin, if I go to you in Washington, you penned an article for Antiwar.com titled, Putin's Ultimate Solution for Ukraine May Be the Best. What is that solution and why is it the best? Well, I think uh, we have to uh, take into consideration how this was done, and I don't approve of the, uh, you know, the way that Putin has done this. But in the long term, it seems to me that uh, people have the right to self-determination, and if, they, if there's a legitimate vote and they uh, decide that they want to be part of Russia or an independent uh, uh, nation that's, uh, you know, affiliated in some way with Russia, or even, uh, you know, autonomous from the, U the rest of Ukraine, I think that may be the best solution, the most stable solution over time is to have uh, the, the eastern part of Ukraine and the Crimea and the south. Uh, perhaps they don't want to be with the rest of Ukraine. It's something like uh, Czech and Slovakia, Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, uh, peacefully uh, disengaged from each other after the Cold War was over. John, in, in Washington, it seems to me that that might be the solution if the current regime in Kiev continues to be in place. And it's, I find it very interesting, it's only been in the last few days that the type of regime is, is finally being told to Western audiences, ultranationalist, neo-fascist with a very, very ugly agenda. How it got, how it's uh, working with the U.S. government in Brussels is a mystery to me. Go ahead, John. Well, first, I, I want to uh, disagree a little bit with Ivan about a uh, referendum. Of course, I think a referendum, if it's free and fair, is an excellent way of judging uh, popular sovereignty, popular self-determination. But I wouldn't call what's taking place in Crimea today uh, a free and fair referendum. I mean, we talk about things as kangaroo courts here in uh, the United States. I would call this a kangaroo referendum. It's by no means free and fair. The kinds of pressure that's being put on people, the atmosphere of fear in Crimea today, I would not call this uh, the kind of situation that we had in Czechoslovakia when the Czech Republic and Slovakia amicably decided to divorce. Uh, on the question of the far right, of course, there is a very troubling uh, fascist or neo-fascist extreme right group uh, uh, groups in Kiev, we're talking about right sector, we're talking about Svoboda. Are they popular? No. I mean, if you look at any kind of public opinion polls uh, in Ukraine today, they poll very, very low. However, I would say that their popularity has a, te has a grave potential of increasing in a situation that we have today with greater pressure coming from Russia on Ukraine. Okay, John, I would like to, go ahead, John. I, I would like to, ahead, I would like to disagree, disagree about the situation uh, with the Crimean uh, referendum. Uh, w w from what I hear from uh, the situation on ground, uh, reading from uh, Western uh, journalists, journalists that uh, clearly have an anti-Putin, anti-Russia agenda, uh, they are uh, uh, reporting that the people uh, seem to be uh, genuinely joyous uh, about uh, the, uh, the possibility to join uh, Russia. And uh, we will have a referendum uh, that will show how, how big a percentage uh, of the people are uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for independence and then joining joining uh, Russia. So I don't see any any problem with uh, the legitimacy of the referendum. Okay, John in Moscow, would you say that referendum would be more legitimate than the coup that happened in Kiev? Absolutely not. I mean, the referendum is completely legitimate. The people there want uh, to vote, and let's see how they vote. The opinion polls say that they. Uh, they will go 80% uh, uh, for joining Russia. I think they will go 90%. 
the coup uh, in, in Kiev is totally uh, illegitimate, undemocratic, and fascist. fascist. Okay, if I, if I go back to you in Washington, I think, I think it's really quite interesting is that President Obama met with the interim, what they call the interim prime minister. Is the United States making a commitment to that government there? Because this is, again, driving events in Crimea and possibly in eastern Ukraine. They'll say, well, if the Americans choose this guy in this government, why should we stay in this country? We should vote to get out. That's what's happening. Yes, well, first of all, I'd like to say I, I agree with John in Washington that this is not... I don't. I disagree with the way Putin is doing this. But if the referendum were fair, Excuse me, how, then I think what, what, what we can Putin have. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Keep going. Keep going. Go ahead. John can relax, uh, reply in a second. Go ahead. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure this. I'm not sure this is going to be a fair referendum, but we'll see. Uh, but if there is a fair referendum, then, you know, that's, that's a different story, I think. And I also think that the, the United States should avoid uh, Cold War confrontation over this. The bottom line, from my perspective, is that Ukraine is not strategic to the United States. It's very strategic to Russia for a number of reasons. Uh, and I think that, uh, as in Syria, it's almost as if Russia is supporting one side, we have to support the other side. And as I say, I'm, I don't support the way Putin has gone about this, but I'm not sure that the United States should be uh, taking such a visible support of the Ukrainian, the new Ukrainian government. Okay, John, in, in Moscow, do you want to reply to that? Go ahead. This is crosstalk, yes, uh, after all. Y uh, yes, it really... Uh I wonder what is it that Putin has done. Uh, I, I, I don't see anything that Putin has done. I see that uh, what the USA and uh, the EU leaders have done is that they have uh, instigated a violent uh, coup, uh, coup d'etat in Kiev and unleashed uh, fascist uh, mobs. Uh, so, but I, I, don't, I don't really see. Could you please, uh, Ivan? Uh, I, Ivan, answer to me, what is it that Putin has done? Well, I think he's violated the sovereignty of a, of a, uh, of a country. Uh, now, maybe the boundaries aren't very good uh, as far as ethnic, the, the state boundaries don't go with the ethnic and um, uh, uh, religious uh, and, and language uh, uh, of the, of the various populations there, but it's still uh, a sovereign country. And admittedly, the United States uh, has, uh, has no place to, to criticize Russia for doing this since it's done this multiple times itself. But, uh, you know, I think uh, in today's world, sovereignty is sovereignty, and the, and the system is set up so that we don't do that sort of thing. And I don't think we should approve it no matter who does it. And, uh, and I think both powers should avoid doing this. And all, all great powers should, should uh, uh, respect the sovereignty of other countries. And if we want to adjust the boundaries, we can do that. And there is resistance among nation states to doing that, obviously. But uh, I think it can be done in a peaceful manner. And I still think we could have well, a peaceful okay. resolution I, I, of this I, crisis. I, 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 so, gentlemen, I'd like to point out to our viewers, it's been extremely peaceful in Crimea. Okay, let's keep this in mind. I, uh, as far I, I, as I know, not one shot has been fired in anger. Okay, John Pfeiffer and me in Washington, please jump in. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the illegitimacy of what took place in Kiev versus what took place in Crimea, let's, it's true, obviously. There have been no shots fired in either case. We've had an extraordinary restraint on all sides, oh, which is excellent. Oh, come on, really? John, John, uh, we have, there's, we have ev to say there's that growing on... evidence that the snipers were in pay by the Maidan crowd. I mean, what, that's violence. You know, 80 people yeah. shot. There, that's there's violence. There's no evidence of that. that there's, there's no violence. That, there's no evidence that I there were snipers. I, of course, snipers? support any kind of investigation into that. But let's be honest here. If we look at the situation in Crimea, we had armed gunmen who went into the parliament, seized control of parliament, and basically already announced that, that there will be an independent Crimea ahead of a referendum. And are these self-defense forces in Crimea? I'm sorry, but even the head of the International Relations Committee in the Duma has admitted finally that those are Russian troops that are in Crimea. This is a violation of sovereignty. I want to be clear here. I am not happy about NATO expansion up to the doorstep of Russia. I am not happy about many things with U.S. foreign policy. But what Putin has done in this case, and I want to stress, this is Putin 
Putin, not the Russian people. Putin has done in this case is illegitimate. Okay, John, I'd like to go to you in Moscow. Um, Putin's, yeah. po Putin's popularity is at its highest point since he's come back to office. I'd like our viewers to know that. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I, of course, I need to go back to that. Uh, 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 John and uh, uh, Ivan are saying that it's wrong to, uh, for Putin to violate sovereignty of a country. But, but who violated sovereignty of country? It's the uh, EU and USA who instigated a violent coup with armed men, with, uh, uh, with snipers killing people, and with thousands and thousands of uh, armed uh, thugs uh, uh, attacking uh, uh, policemen, blocking streets, uh, uh, taking over government buildings, going over to the parliament at gunpoint, uh, uh, pressuring, uh, uh, pressuring uh, uh, members of parliament uh, to vote uh, on, on their uh, agenda, burning down uh, 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 the, uh, the house of the Communist Party leader to show uh, their, their terror. That's uh, violating sov sovereignty, and what Putin, uh, if, you, if we say Putin, these are the people Russia. of Ukraine who did this. The people of Ukraine in Kiev did this, and I'd like to remind they you are, they, there they, is the party of regions that they abandoned they are, Yanukovych. They are mobs His that are directed by the CIA. Abandoned oh. him. This was. CIA? I'm sorry, no. This was the people of Ukraine who rose up and got rid of an illegitimate and corrupt leader. His oh, own come on. Party All right, I'm going to have to jump in here. In We're going to jump in. We're going to go to a short break. We'll Parliament. keep our debate going. After a short break, we'll continue our discussion on Ukraine. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the events unfolding in Ukraine. Ivan Elin, I'd like to go back to you in Washington. I think one of the interesting things here is, is the legitimacy issue overall. In, in, and we go from the entire country, from Kiev all the way to Crimea. I'd like to point out by, at the end of the program that John in Washington said that Yanukovych was illegitimate. He was elected and Brussels signed off on it, and so did Washington. Did he lose his moral legitimacy? We probably would agree on that. So, Ivan, is this really the issue here? Because it's the legitimacy issue, issue and uh, as I pointed out in the first part of the program, is the United States and the European Union are going to embrace this government that is constitutionally illegitimate. Why should the people in the East and South and Crimea uh, stay with that agenda? Because it's certainly they feel threatened by it. Well, I think you can't dismiss that they do. And uh, Ukraine has been whipsawed from east and west. And in the long term, uh, and I don't think we can do this by any sort of coercion on either side, but in the long term, it might be better if there were some sort of a division of Ukraine. But uh, right now, in the heat of the crisis, of course, the West uh, is saying, well, Putin has had this aggression and we can't, uh, we can't, um, you know, uh, validate that. And on the other side, uh, the Russians are saying, well, we're threatened by this new government and we have to protect uh, Russian speaking people. And I think uh, to some extent, uh, there needs to be a cooling of heads uh, here and uh, uh, negotiation, perhaps some sort of autonomy for for uh, the Russian-speaking parts of U Ukraine, or at least uh, Crimea, until we can sort this out in the long term, when, it, when, when the tempers are not so high. John Hillevig in Washington, how much does this have to do with NATO expansion in your mind? You meant me. Barack yeah, probably, right, yes. in Moscow. Yeah, it's, it's all about uh, NATO expansion. It's all about the geopolitical uh, goals uh, uh, of the West, of the Western elite, I would say. Uh, the thing is that uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there has been an, uh, 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 an ongoing uh, process, uh, process to bring uh, NATO closer and closer to Russian borders to encircle uh, uh, Russia. And uh, now uh, uh, Ukraine is the uh, last uh, bit uh, uh, that, uh, of the last piece that they need to grab. Of course, there is Finland also, which is still free from NATO, but, uh, but Ukraine is, uh, 
uh, is, is where they can, uh, can do it. And that's why they have been fomenting uh, uh, this uh, uprising. That's why they have been investing uh, uh, billions uh, of, of dollars uh, in, uh, in this campaign. And that's why they have uh, close relations uh, with the fascist and, and Nazi uh, thugs there. And that's why they have. Uh, 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 that's why they have no problem uh, with the uh, uh, with the snipers uh, of the uh, Maidan uh, leaders killing their own people and, and police. Uh, so it's, it's they are just doing this everything for the geopolitical. Uh, 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 goal to weaken Russia. You know, John, in Washington, it's very interesting if you look at the terms and conditions for a country to join NATO. They don't, they cannot have a territorial dispute with a neighbor. And the whole Crimea issue is that dispute. Would you agree? This is Russia putting a stop to NATO expansion after it had been promised before that it would not expand. Uh, expand. And, and now this is the Russian government saying, we found a way to stop you guys. Is it going to work? Well, yeah, as I said, I think that uh, the United States and NATO bears some responsibility for pushing NATO expansion beyond the bounds that uh, the United States basically had promised in the immediate post-war period. Uh, I, as Ivan said, and I think it is an excellent point, we do have an opportunity here when cooler heads prevail to actually take another look at the security architecture in Europe. We had an opportunity in 1991, 1992 to emphasize, for instance, the, the CSCE as it became the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, to put an emphasis on that as a much more inclusive organization to kind of uh, oversee security relations in Europe. And instead, unfortunately, NATO became a much more dominant form. Uh, I think that Russia has legitimate concerns when it comes to NATO expansion. We do have an opportunity to revisit this question of European security infrastructure or European security architecture, as well as energy architecture, so that we know we avoid the kind of Cold War atmosphere that is unfortunately building right now and which will not help Ukraine in the long term. Exactly. It, it polarizes Ukraine. It forces Ukraine to make a choice rather than Ukraine serving as a bridge, as it should, between Europe and Russia. You know, if I, what, everything that John just said, is, I agree with completely, 100 percent. But you have Victoria Newland, you have Ben Rhodes, you have Samantha Power. I mean, they have nothing to do with what John just had to say. Uh, well, I agree with the other two uh, uh, participants that uh, NATO expansion, I think, is one of the central problems because, of course, there was talk about bringing Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, which I thought was uh, sheer folly. And uh, Russia is reacting both in Georgia and Ukraine, I think, uh, to the NATO expansion. Ukraine is very important for Russia, as we all know. And, uh, you know, it goes back to uh, um, Bush, the, the first Bush's uh, or, uh, verbal promise to Mikhail Gorbachev uh, when they were uh, to get the uniting of Germany, get him to agree to that. They said that NATO wouldn't expand. And, of course, it has expanded several times and right up to Russia's borders. And uh, that uh, has to be unnerving for a country that has been invaded repeatedly and had uh, 40 million uh, dead in two world wars. So I think uh, uh, you have to take that uh, Russian perspective into account. And NATO and uh, the West have just moved forward with their uh, expansion, both the EU and NATO. John, in, in, in Moscow, I, I think, you know, it, things happen so quickly now because of what's going on in Crimea and what's going on in Kiev. But we had an agreement. February 21st, there was an agreement hammered out to, that could have avoided all of this, and it was the, the rioters that said, no, we don't want this, and they're the ones that have created this new government. Is it possible in your mind that we can get back to February 21st? Uh, as I said uh, before, uh, the Western uh, countries and their secret services, they are those who have uh, instigated this coup. They have those uh, that have pushed uh, uh, the fascist Nazi groups uh, to the forefront. But I think they have lost control, as it always goes with fascists, when, we play, when you play with the fire. So they are not anymore taking the dictates for their uh, puppet masters. 
And uh, I, I think that uh, there's nothing that the Western powers anymore can do to, uh, to, to, to contain them. I, I, I see that uh, this uh, crisis will probably go from uh, bad to worse. John in Washington, you know, why is the persistence of this Cold War mentality certainly coming out of Washington? And I'll, I'm perfectly willing to admit, out of the city that I live in right now, there are people that have a Cold War mentality. Why can't we get over it? Well, that's a tough question. Um, let me just uh, say one thing to John in Moscow uh, about the possibility of going back to the February 21st agreement. I, I don't think it is possible. Again, the parliament in Kiev voted to impeach Yanukovych. We could talk about the difference of 10 votes there is no uh, that parliament was necessary anymore. for a three quarters majority, but that was a decision by parliament. Uh, and it's, there is no we'll see eventually there is no an election parliament. in all of Ukraine that will eventually make, I hope, a uh, legitimate, fully legitimate, constitutionally legitimate government. The question of the Cold War atmosphere, again, you know, we have rival interests between Washington and Moscow. Uh, and the United States, unfortunately, over a period of time uh, after 9-11, aggressively expanded its military uh, spending, its foreign policy and interventions overseas, held on to its kind of unipolar position as the strongest superpower in the world. Unfortunately, that has had a backlash. It's understandable that a country like Russia uh, is going to say, hey, you know, enough is enough. But there has to be compromise on this. It can't just be uh, Russia saying, okay, we'll pull back. Well, the United States <laughs> and Europe also has, have to adopt essentially a code of conduct, a post Cold War code of conduct. There has to be an agreement by both sides that the Cold War is over and that we all have to act that way. Ivan, again, I have to agree with John, but I, again, I don't see out of policy circles in Washington that anybody wants that. I mean, Russia just is being encircled. That's not paranoia. That's a fact with NATO and, and, and other bases around the world here. I mean, there's no wonder Russia is going to react. It finally reacted. It felt very, very offended when the crowds uh, overturned the agreement of the 21st of February because Russia didn't really particularly like that compromise, but it was workable. This is why we're getting so many tensions. There's no trust right now when it comes to Ukraine. Well, I don't think, I think that's exactly correct. And uh, the United States has pursued a neo-containment policy in Europe and also, I would argue, against China in, the, in East Asia. And I, I think these, uh, these Cold War um, mentality ha has, has, di has died uh, very slowly, if at all, and probably not at all, really. I think we see uh, it's just replaced by uh, uh, neocontainment, and uh, that's, that's what we know. That's what uh, has seemingly worked in, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed and that sort of thing. And so the United States just keeps marching forward and saying the old uh, uh, thing, you know, you want to get, keep your enemy as far away from, from your country as you can. And we've just kept marching forward, mar marching the line forward. And that's the mentality that our defense establishment still has. All right, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating debate, and I'm glad we covered a lot of different opinions here. Many thanks to my guests in Washington and in Moscow, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.